Good Sunday morning to you. Welcome to this third Sunday in the season of Lent. I'm glad you're here with us this day. My name is Jennifer Jaimez and I serve St. Mark's United Church of Christ in Bloomington, Minnesota. I, along with Scott Seifert and Dan Edgren, welcome you to this worship service. I pray that this service feeds your spirit in life-giving ways as we go throughout our days. This service, as well as all our other worship services, can be found on our Facebook page as well as our YouTube channel. You can also find us on our website where you can learn more about the mission and ministry of this church. We will be celebrating Holy Communion this day, so I invite you to have a piece of bread and a cup filled with water or coffee or tea nearby. Even though we are worshiping virtually this day, Christ invites us all to Christ's table. Even though we are part, we are bound together by God's Holy Spirit. This month, we are accepting donations for Minnesota's biggest annual food and fund drive organized by Minnesota Food Share. This March 1st through April 11th campaign is the largest grassroots food drive in the state, accomplished by groups and individuals engaged to fight against hunger. Donations that are received at St. Mark's will go towards VEEP, our local, our local food shelf organization, to help them reach their goal of 75,000 pounds of food and $175,000. Please consider giving a financial gift to VEEP. Every $10 that you give equals food for families to make 30 meals. Thank you for your generosity. With all that being said, I invite you to take a breath in and a breath out so that we might prepare our hearts and minds for worship this day. I invite you to join in the call to worship if you have a bulletin. Otherwise, I invite you to hear these words. One step on the path. We are returning home, drawing closer to God. We are coming back home. Seeing the errors we've made, we are turning toward home. Knowing more about ourselves, we are making our way home. Trusting in God's embrace, we are coming home. Together, let us join our voices in the opening hymn as we gather at your table. Dan? Thank you. 
you, Dan. Let us together pray. Rejoicing God, you celebrate when one of your lost children is found because no one is worthless to you. We stand humbled and in awe that you would count us among your most prized possessions. Give us eyes to see the priceless value of every living soul for the sake of the one who, came, who became human for the sake of our souls. Jesus Christ, our seeker. Amen. It's time for the young people to come on down, so I invite you to come closer to the screen. And good morning, it's good to see you all this day. I have something to show you. Do you know what this is? Right, it's a puzzle. Do you like doing puzzles? I know a lot of people at our church love doing puzzles and in the winter time especially they set up a card table and then they take out a puzzle with some kind of picture on it and then they open up the box and they have all of these little tiny pieces and they spread them all out on the table and they spend hours putting together this lovely puzzle. I have to confess that puzzles are not my favorite. I have a hard time trying to figure out where this little piece goes in the puzzle. And I look and I look and I look and I can't quite, well this one's not so bad because it has a straight edge on it, but the ones that have no straight edges are terrible and I can't figure out where they go. Rather than being relaxing as everybody tells me puzzles are, they are frustrating and oftentimes I just have to walk away and come back especially when the puzzle piece is lost and it cannot find its way to where it's supposed to go. But I do have to tell you that when I finally find where that puzzle piece needs to go in the puzzle, I am so happy. Sometimes I even share with John that I found the puzzle piece place and it just delights me. You know, the puzzle is not complete until all of the pieces get put right in their place. And at first it just seems as though the puzzle is a jumble of pieces and it isn't gonna make any sense. But slowly and surely, a picture begins to emerge. And each one of those puzzle pieces is an important part of that whole picture. Today in the Bible, we are going to hear stories about being lost and being found a little bit like that puzzle piece that's lost until it finds its place. Jesus tells stories about a lost sheep and a lost coin and even a lost child. And Jesus tells us how happy God is when what was once lost was found. We're all a little bit like puzzle pieces. Each one of us is important and each of us make up the picture that God has created of all creation. And if we ever get lost, we are reminded that God never gives up looking for us and rejoices when we are found. I'm so excited for you to hear the stories this day, but let's say a prayer first before you go back. I invite you to repeat after me. Thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you, God, for always being with me. Thank you, God, for always finding me, even if I get lost. Amen. Thanks for coming up. I'll see you next week. Our scripture reading this morning is Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 32. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. 
Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will give up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen. For all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, You are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Here ends our reading for today. In Scottsboro, Alabama, there is a place called the Unclaimed Baggage Center. This is not your typical retail store. The building covers an entire city block and has become one of Alabama's top tourist attractions, hosting more than a million visitors each year. The Unclaimed Baggage Center is a -a one-of-a-kind retail store full of lost treasures. It is the nation's only merchant of unclaimed and lost airline baggage and their contents. Among the lost items that have ended up there 
was a Limoges vase that was sold to a customer for $80, but was later valued at $18,000. A painting originally marked for $60 was later found to be worth $25,000. And one of the most stunning finds was a 5.8 carat diamond and platinum ring that someone packed in a sock and tucked away in an unclaimed suitcase. You would surely think that someone would have wanted that ring back, but apparently not. Many of us have a lost and found drawer or cabinet or basket. In the past, mine has held single mittens, single socks, a key to something, a screw or two, more than one button, oftentimes a single earring or maybe just the backing of an earring, pieces of paper with notes or numbers on them, which no longer make any sense, but I feel like I should keep them just in case. I have yet to find anything much of value. I certainly haven't discovered a diamond ring. Does this sound familiar at all? Or maybe it's just me. Many months ago, during the beginning of the pandemic, I lost the remote control to the television. That was not a good thing to lose. It's small, and so I thought it probably slipped between the cushions in the couch and was underneath somewhere. So I turned the couch completely upside down and I shook it, trying to hear where this remote was and nothing, silence. We could not use the television without this little tiny remote. I searched drawers, and the pockets of all my pants and my bathrobe, nothing. So we had to order another remote because it's hard to imagine pandemic life without the television. Fast forward many months later, I pulled out one of the books that I use when studying the scriptures in preparation for writing a sermon. And when I pulled the book out and set it on the table, I heard this noise, something had fallen to the floor. I looked down and there was the remote. It had been there the whole entire time and I never saw it. Apparently I use remotes as bookmarks and when I was done with the book, I closed the book up and put it back in the shelf. Apparently, I didn't notice that there was this bulge in the book. I was so happy when I found it, even though he had already bought a new one several months prior. The mystery, however, was solved. It was all good in the world. It wasn't tucked somewhere inside the couch. But the lesson of the day, don't use remote controls for bookmarks. It's a bad idea. In today's reading, Jesus tells three parables, one about a sheep, one about a coin, and one about a father and his two sons. And like all of Jesus's parables, each of them contain an excess of meaning, and truly we can spend a lifetime dwelling in the midst of these stories. We're not going to come to all the meanings this morning. But that's good. It just means that there's more to explore next time around. And you might have gotten the idea that it is going to be about being lost and being found. So the first parable is about a shepherd and his sheep. The shepherd is responsible for the lives of his sheep. He leads them to green pastures and beside still waters. He protects them from predators. He cares for them when they get injured. Luke tells us that they are in the wilderness, a dangerous and hard place to live. And so the shepherd's role is even more important. The shepherd notices that one of his sheep is gone, lost, missing. While the shepherd might be a bit sad, and maybe that's just the cost of the shepherding business, losing a sheep now and then, the other 99 are just fine. Most people hearing this parable realize the danger of leaving the other 99 and would not expect the shepherd to go after this one lost sheep. Yet, and this is always the case with Jesus' parables, the shepherd doesn't do what is expected. 
the shepherd does leave the other 99, goes and finds the lost sheep, and when he finds that lost sheep, carries the sheep on his shoulders and calls out to his friends and neighbors and say, says, rejoice with me, for my sheep was lost and is now found. The second parable is about a woman who has lost a silver coin, a coin which is worth a day's work. Even though she has nine other coins, this coin is precious. And so she lights a lamp and she searches high and low for this coin until it is found. And when it is found, she calls out to her friends and neighbors and rejoices for what was once lost is now found. In the first two parables, we can understand ourselves perhaps as the lost sheep or even the lost coin. And we can see God as the shepherd or the woman. Both are powerful images for God. The shepherd and the woman seek out what is lost, and when what is lost is found, not only do they rejoice, they call others to rejoice with them. But then we come to the third of these parables, all three told together, each informing the other, and this one is a little more complex. A man has two sons, and the youngest son asks for his inheritance early. This would have been shocking to hear. The interpretation ranges from simply inappropriate to really wishing his father were dead right now so that he might receive his inheritance. It was certainly not the way things should be done. Yet the man gives both his sons their inheritance. The youngest one takes off, squanders all the money, and is left destitute. The pigs that he ends up caring for are eating better than he is. And so he realizes maybe it's time to come home. It must be a long journey home. I imagine he's dreading the reception that he is sure to receive, wondering if his father will even see him. He left on such a high and he's returning on such a low. It doesn't seem so much that he's truly repentant, more just like he's got nowhere else to go. And so he starts the journey home. After a long journey, after all that he said and did, he sees his father on the road, or rather, his father sees him. And his father races out and embraces him, gives him a robe and a ring, and sets out to host a party with his friends and his neighbors, rejoicing and celebrating, because his child, who was lost, is found. All of this happens before the son even says a word to his father. As usual, this is an unexpected turn of events. Most would not have expected the father to be so gracious, so loving, so forgiving, so generous, and yet. Meanwhile, the older and elder brother is working in the fields. Of course he's working in the fields because he's doing what's expected of him. And he hears some party noise going on, and he comes down to check it out. He is not happy. After all these years of working on his father's fields, his father has never once thrown a party for him, never even given him a goat so that he might celebrate with his friends. Disgruntled, angry, and I would imagine a bit jealous. The older brother pouts and refuses to come to the party. The scriptures leave it end there. What will the elder brother decide to do? Will he join with the others and give thanks to God that his brother is home safe? Or will he stay outside, resentful, not only toward his brother, but really toward his father as well? The scriptures don't tell us, and so we're left to our imaginations. What would you have done? The parable, the parable of the prodigal son is a much-beloved parable. 
almost, if not more so, than the parable of the Good Samaritan read just a couple weeks ago. It is beloved in part because we can see ourselves in that parable, sometimes as the foolish younger brother, sometimes as the resentful older brother. Sometimes we can even see ourselves as the parent longing for our child to return safely home. Oftentimes it is only the youngest son who is labeled lost, but it really seems as if both sons are lost, just in different ways. The eldest son had everything. All that, the father, all that was the father's was his, and yet he still was not satisfied. The youngest son had lost everything in the worship of money and all that money buys, and he soon learns that there is much more to life than that. Of course, we are to understand that the Father is God. And what another wonderful image of God is one who looks for us, who longs for us to return when we have strayed or when we are lost, who longs for us to return when we have strayed and who rejoices when we come back home. In the first parable, the shepherd searches for the sheep. And in the second parable, the woman searches for the coin. But in the third parable, the father does not go after the younger son. I'm not sure about free will for sheep. I know pretty much coins do not have free will. But humankind is created by God with the gift and the responsibility of free will. God does not force us to return to God when we stray. But I believe God never gives up waiting and hoping that we will return. And when we do, there is rejoicing even amongst the angels in heaven. Oftentimes we see ourselves as the 99, the faithful ones. We see ourselves as the elder son, the one who always does what he's supposed to do, the righteous one or maybe self-righteous one. We go to church, we give our, our resources to others, we strive to love God and our neighbor. Yet, as the saying goes, the shepherd leaving the 99 to find one seems crazy until you are that one. Maybe we are the one. Maybe we've been the one. Maybe we will be the one. Jesus came to proclaim that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him and has anointed him to proclaim good news to the poor. He has been sent to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind to set the oppressed free. Jesus didn't come so much for the 99 as he came for those who are lost. Through the scriptures, we see Jesus gathering those around him, the tax collectors and the sinners alike, and welcoming them to the table to fellowship, to community. The 99 are going to be okay, just as the elder son. They and we should rejoice that God's grace has not been withheld from us, but freely offered. How is it then that we are so often resentful of others who have been offered that same grace? These three parables are understood about lost sheep or lost coins or lost sons. But really, these parables are mostly about God. How God longs to gather all the sheep, all the coins, all God's children. For God has made and declared each of us worthy and beloved, even the Pharisees, even the lost ones, even us. God notices when we are missing from the fold, when we lose our way, and the good news is that we are never beyond God's reach. We are never beyond God's mercy and grace. And our response for all our days is to sing God's praise. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to give. Our church's ministries are extension of God's love and faithfulness made possible through the generous giving of our time, energy, and money. With love, let us offer our gifts to God. 
You can give by sending a check directly into the church or by going to our website at the bottom of the home page. There'll be a donate button and you'll be able to give through PayPal, either a one-time donation or you can set up a recurring monthly donation. We thank you for your generosity. I now invite us into a time of silent prayer where we might lift up our joys and concerns to God. After this time of silence, I will call us back together with the pastoral prayer. Let us pray. Gracious, patient, and forgiving God, you give us grace even in times when we fall short. There have been times when I have been like the son who feels like he can separate from you. I have turned from you, feeling like my desires and needs have not been connected with yours. Other times I have felt like the son who has followed the rules and done what I should. Yet even then, I still stay separated from your grace and do not celebrate when that which is lost is found. Today we give thanks and ask for a repentant heart as we move towards a new season. A season of new creation, of new growth, and of resurrection. We give thanks for those who care for us and for the opportunities we have to care for others. We give thanks that no matter where we go, you are with us and provide us with that grace if only we turn toward you and ask. We give thanks for those that have worked so hard to develop and administer the protection that comes through us through the scientific achievement of the vaccine. Please be with us when we and so many around us are struggling. Help us to turn towards you in this new season of creation. Help us to be a piece of the larger puzzle of your design. We ask for the end of this season, which has kept us so physically separated from each other and all of those that we love. We ask that through your grace and love and peace shown to us through Jesus the Christ, that we shall be given the gift of the Spirit, which only comes through you. Let us pray together with the prayer given to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We will continue this service with Holy Communion. Friends, we have gathered together around our many tables, trusting that through the power of the Holy Spirit, God is building a great table, one that transcends the distance between us. All are welcome to Christ's table of abundance. May we, those who gather near and far, together and apart, Recognize Christ in this meal that unites us with Christ and with one another. So that we might come to Christ's table unburdened and cleansed of sin, 
Let us confess our sins before God and receive the gift of forgiveness once again. We confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have loved you, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us and lead us into new life once again. I invite you into a time of silent confession. When we confess our sins before God, God who is faithful and just forgives us our sin and invites us into life anew. Friends, believe the good news that in Christ our sins are indeed forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. God of life and all creatures from the first day to this day, you have showered us with gifts of mercy and grace. From the first day to this day, you have sent us signs and wonders, prophets and dreamers to call us to yourself and to offer us your grace. Healing for our brokenness, release from our pain, calm for our mental stress, peace for soul grief and regret, pardon to remedy our sin, and justice to make life whole and glad. Thanks and praise to you for all your gifts and most of all for Jesus, our wounded, risen brother and friend. He abides with us here in mystery as he abided that last night among his friends. From his safe and holy hands, you give us this, our daily bread, his body surrendered for us. From his safe and holy hands, we also now receive this brimming cup, this life, poured out for us. We remember him now as he told us to do whenever we break bread and drink his cup at our tables. And we take him to ourselves in this time of illness and fear. We remember before you the people we love, the enemies we do not love, and all who suffer in this world, the frail and falling sparrows on whom your eye is fixed. By grace and power of the Spirit, let all who share this bread and cup be one in Christ, no matter where we are, near or far, together or apart, one in heart and purpose, one in love and service, one in fearless witness to new heavens and new earth, that joyous realm to come, where by your promise there will be no more sickness or dying, no tears or grieving, but only joy, only life only justice, only you. All praise and thanks to you, God of all life, now and forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you to take a piece of bread and eat it in remembrance of Christ who offers to all the bread of life. I invite you to take a drink of whatever you might have in your cup this day, remembering that Christ gave it to each to drink in remembrance of him, the new covenant poured out for each of you. I invite you to join me in the prayer of thanksgiving if you have a bulletin with you. Spirit of Christ, you have blessed our tables and our lives. May the eating of this bread give us courage to speak faith and act love, not only in church sanctuaries, but in your precious world. And may the drinking of this cup renew our hope, even in the midst of this pandemic. Wrap your hopeful presence around all whose bodies, spirits, and hearts need healing, and let us become your compassion and safe refuge. Amen. Let us together join our voices in the closing hymn, 
Amazing Grace. Dan? stand. Hear now the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with kindness and grant you peace this day and forevermore. And let all God's people say, Amen. God's peace be with you. We'll see you next week.